And welcome everybody to another Smart Money Circle episode. I'm Adam Sarhan. With me today is Chris O'Keefe, who's the CFA Lead Portfolio Manager at Logan Capital, which over for the firm has over $4 billion in assets under management. Chris, thank you so much for taking the time and coming on the show today. Absolutely, Adam. Sounds great. So Chris, I'm excited. Today, you you specialize in dividends. So we're going to speak about income and dividends. Uh, you've got two strategies that you offer, dividend performer strategy and dividend performers balance strategy. I'd love to learn more about those. But before we dive into that, can you tell us your story and how you got to where you are today, please? Absolutely, Adam. So um, I guess uh, going back to 1987, uh, that's when I got into the business. I, I graduated from college and went through a, a bank training program. And I, it was sort of interesting. I had, I had an option of going into credit or going into investments. And um, I made the, uh, the right hand turn into investments and, and that got me started. It was an interesting year, of course, because 1987, we had the crash and that was my introduction to, to the business. And I thought, boy, this is a pretty wild business to be in. I wonder if I want to go back to credit again and just make simple loans to uh, mom and pops. But uh, so from there, I kind of went in. Um, you know, as you know, today in the today's world, you have growth managers, you have value managers, you have small cap, mid cap. And so I kind of um, started in, in, a, in a growth world. Um, and back then, you know, growthy names were, were GE and, and um, you know, names like that, not like uh, in, NVIDIA today. But um, so, I, you know, cut my teeth on as a growth manager and then worked my way up to uh, I shifted from a, a bank uh, over to an independent money manager around the, around, uh, you know, 1990s. And they happened to be a value manager. Now, that okay. was not a great time, not a great time at all to be a value manager. Uh, the best we could do was maybe buy, you know, some telecom stock that uh, looked kind of valuish, but it was st still trading at 50 times earnings uh, right at the uh, the dot com time. But um, oh, it was certainly interesting to learn the whole, uh, you know, what it's like to buy you know, value stocks. And that really kind of formed um, in me, you know, uh, the idea that um, dividends matter. You know, it isn't just about, you know, looking for earnings you know, five and 10 and 15 years out there somewhere, you really want to have current income uh, coming. It, it really does matter. And and, and I, I learned, learned a lot about uh, compounding uh, interest and compounding dividends, of course. So, you know, we figured out that um, actually, if you do hold the stock for long periods of time um, and they're paying dividends, that can be more than half of your returns over long periods of time. So so having dividends really, really does matter. And, and you find that a lot of investors tend to be Older, uh, you know, and and um, and, and they, they kind of like having you know this sort of current income as well. So uh, so now we, we work for Logan. Um, I actually uh, came here from um, John Hancock, and uh, we are, our, we had the team was at John Hancock for a long time. And I worked for um, our strategy is called Dividend Performers, and Dividend Performance has actually been around um, for like over thirty years, and. Um, I've been on that for 20 years, so that, that kind of shows you my dedication to to dividend growth uh, uh, on that strategy. But uh, we moved the team over to to Logan uh, back in 2019, and so we've been here three four years and uh, great experience so far. And, and like I said, we we have a um, dividend performers is is a you know, high quality dividend growth strategy, but we also have a balance strategy as well. It's a 60 40 with 40 percent in in bonds. So oh, I love that. So that was my next question. Can you tell us a little about your investment strategy? I love the growth component and the dividend overlay since half of the returns come from dividends and the growth is what your core, where you tried value, but you resonated more towards growth. Uh, please let us know a little about the investment strategy. And if you want to go a little deeper, by all means, please feel free. Absolutely, Adam. Um, so the key to our strategy is we only buy companies that have increased dividend consistently over time. And I'm sure you know, many of your audience may have heard of dividend achievers, which you have to have at least 10 years of rising dividends. And there's also um, what, what the aristocrats, which is 25 years. For us, we we have it's at least five years, and we think that that's that's not a bad um, period of time. Where, where number one, that your universe is pretty wide. You know, the the longer the dividend growth over time, the smaller the universe, because the smaller amount of companies have actually been able to do that. But but if you've if you've increased dividend pretty consistently for the last five years, that, that tells you a lot about the company and, and their consistency and, and their ability to do that. But let, let's step back for a second. You know, what is the philosophy behind dividend growth? Why, why do we even care about growing dividends? And to us, you know, if you look at that management team that makes that decision to first of all initiate a dividend and then have that commitment to, to increase that dividend every year. 
that's really significant. It's, it's just it's a very it's, it's a really positive signaling event when it, when a company does that. Um, and and also the the discipline you have to have, you know, to to want to do that to every year consistently increase that dividend. That that's pretty impressive as, as well. But it, it tells you a lot about the company. I mean, it, if you have that ability to grow and, and increase dividends, obviously your cash flow has got to be pretty significant. It's got to be fairly, you know, you you trust me. You, you know it's there. You know it's coming. You you've got a business and. Maybe right. it's, you know, yeah, maybe it's a, a a drug, you know, platform that you have, or maybe it's, you know, like a cloud computing or something. You just know that this is going to be generating cash flow you know, for, for a long period of time. Um, so the opposite of all of that is you don't want to cut your dividend, right? Because that's a really negative signaling effect in the market. You that That is destructive to value. So mm -hmm. if you look over time and you look at companies that have consistently increased dividends um, versus those that... You have only just sort of paid a dividend, not increased it. And those that, that don't pay dividends, um, over long periods of time, dividend growers tend to outperform. And not only that, but they outperform at less risk. And along the way, you're, you're getting income and, and it's a growing income. And, and one of the, 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 the fun things about growing dividends that people don't even think about is if it's growing in your portfolio over time, the yield that you're getting on on your cost just keeps going up and up and up. So you might have, you know, J and J, you might have held it for you know five years, and now your yield on cost is you know five six percent. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the philosophy behind dividend. Well, that's why it, it matters so much to me. And um, discipline in management, you know, strong companies, you know, strong cash flow, and and that compounding over time. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll throw this one last point out there, and I think we were talking earlier about this. You know that it, you take somebody who you know again consistently investing in, in dividend growth companies, you'll find that if you pull apart the 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 performance of the S and P five hundred by price and capital gains, uh, or, or sorry, sorry, price and uh, price gains and and dividends, yeah. you know half of your returns over long periods of time, if not more, come from the dividend. So that that compounding effect is is just so so important. So. I love that, Chris. So let, let me ask you a question about earnings growth. Do you look at just dividend growth or do you look for companies that have or have earnings growth as well or revenue growth? You know, that's a that's a great point. Um, so obviously, the you know, one of our our key the key parts of our, our investment process, there's, there's three of them, actually three, three pillars. You know, one is, you know, financial strength, then was business momentum and the third is, is valuation. And so, you know, that sort of middle one where we're looking at business momentum we want to certainly ensure that 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 earnings momentum is powerful enough, you know, to to grow, and and obviously through that they'll they'll you know, they'll pay dividends. And um, key for us is, you know, we're not looking for those that have payout ratios that are you know 60, 70, 80, 100 percent of earnings. For us, it's it's more about you know, that that ability to grow the dividend. So payout ratios in our mind are more going to be averaging 35, you know, percent or so. Um, so we're actually more keyed into that that business momentum, that earnings growth that will drive dividend growth over time, because we know that that's really the, the source of, the, of value. So the, so they really are they're almost hand in hand, you know, um, because management has has to have made that decision that we are if we grow dividends. If we, I'm sorry, if we, if earnings are going to grow, dividends are going to grow. Yeah. Okay, perfect. That makes sense. Thank you for that. Uh, let's talk about risk management. How do you handle risk and what are some mistakes you see with respect to risk management, please? Yeah, so, you know, we we begin our day with that universe of companies that increase dividends consistently. So the whole the whole universe that we're pulling from, the, our, our pond, tends to be less risk than the overall market. And, and you right. can see that in, in standard deviation and, and you know, uh, uh, how the, the margins that are there, the return equity, the, the quality of, of the companies. They they they're just they're just we're just starting from a point where we're less risky than the I was going to say uh, beta is another way to look at it. Our beta tends to be about you know 0.89 you know so, so yeah that's a pretty significant less than the than the market uh, uh, beta and and it's all coming from the fact that these companies start their day less risky than the overall market. So I think that's that's important to us making sure that you know the company itself starting off is is less risky but also um, in the portfolio we. We we view risk um, in terms of sector and industry as, as versus the S and P five hundred. Now the S and P five hundred has gotten a little weird uh, in, in the last five years because of um, or even last several years because of the dominance of those seven you know uh, companies that are there. You know, and, and honestly, I tell people it's a wonderful thing. It, you know, we these are great technologies, and it's wonderful that it's here in America that it's happening because it's generating income and you know uh, GDP. You know, for the for the whole economy. 
Um, so ha happy to have that, but the S&P 500 happens to be dominated by those companies. Right. Um, so, but we do view the world as, you know, the S&P 500 is, is our diversification platform. So we are diversified across sectors and um, we don't have, you know, as much technology as, or, you know, all of those seven names that we talked about um, as much because to us, you know, you want to have more, more diversification in the portfolio. And, and uh, as I said, a lot of people, you know, those seven names are great, but, you know, the other 493 names actually have some potential too. So let's, let's uh, not forget that. Right. Um, and then ebbs and flows as well too, right? Those seven companies are not going to, you used to have nifty 50 and those were gone and then it, it, the, the dot com stocks and they shift. So now it just happens to be the magnificent seven. Yes. But that's, yeah. That's a great point. Sorry. You were going to say something else. Yeah. No. So I was just sort of, you know, so starting off with less risky companies and then being diversified. And then, you know, we, we, we think of risk also in our, in our process. So we, um, there's that third pillar, which is, is valuation. So we were pretty, um, pretty religious about it. I mean, we try to look at, at, at valuation, um, where the company's at, you know, what, what valuation metric matters the most for each sector or each company, you know? And then we try to look at the entire spectrum of, of the universe um, on a relative basis. So where are these companies trading? Where are these industries trading, you know, versus history versus the S&P 500? So we're looking at, try, try to let level the playing field as much as we can. But what we do is, you know, we, in, of the, that small universe, small inventory of names that we're looking at sort of daily, um, we, we try to, you know, have, we have target prices on all of those. And so every time, you know, we see, you know, that, that name reaching its target price or getting close, we begin to pull back on that position and, and begin to add to things where we see a better opportunity or, or, or in a sense, you know, it's less risk basically in our mind. No, it makes perfect sense. So let's ask you about some timeless lessons that you've learned along the way, either on or off Wall Street. You know, um, and I'll, I see your book in the background there. And I, and I think uh, um, the other aspect of it is, is um, that I'd talk to is your sort of behavioral analysis. You know, the, uh, I think some of the, you know, the biggest mistakes we, we, we make as portfolio managers is you see a stock um, where, you know, you've done your work, you have a great thesis, and, and then you wake up one morning and, and they've missed a quarter and, and the stock might be down 10%. Um, and, and maybe there's a concern in there somewhere. And, and your first gut reaction is, um, I, I can't take it. I'm out, you know. Right. And uh, you know, I've lived with, work with managers that that their gut reaction was always to just sell it and get away, you know. Um, but I, I think the better thing is is you know, you go back to your thesis, go back to your work, you know, the fundamental analysis that that, you, that you've done, and and see if it is temporary. You know, we 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 think of. Uh, holding periods as two and three years, and our, our turnover in the portfolio is tends to be less than twenty percent. So right. you you have to have the fortitude to kind of you know be and be patient and and, and wait and, and come through all of that. Um, so yeah, I think uh, that's certainly one lesson for me is um, you know yeah don't be so quick to sell. I mean these are great companies that, that typically that we're working with. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, the second would be, you know, do your homework. You know, that's just so important. You know, uh, today, you know, a lot of our a lot of our opportunities that we see in the market today are, are great companies that have simply just been overlooked. And and managers today are, out, are always trying to find the next greatest thing and what's the next mega trend. And, and you know, just think about what happened this past year. You know, uh, Glip ones. You know, the the weight control drugs. That's that. Wow, this is this is going to be this going to change the world. You know, everybody's going to be on these drugs, and no one's going to go to McDonald's anymore. You know, and, and and so you saw McDonald's go down, you saw Mondelez go down, these snack manufacturers, um, and that just made no sense to us. You know, and and but so this sort of, you know, everybody, you know, it's like a fire drill. Everybody running in and running out. It, take advantage of that. You know, uh, be patient. Go back to your fundamentals. Go back to your work, and and see you know uh, what makes sense. And um, so yeah, I'd, 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 there's a couple of ones definitely for sure that uh, um, I'd, I'd point out. I love that. So how about timeless mistakes, Chris? What are some timeless mistakes that you've learned along the way that you'd like to share with the audience? Um, I, I'd say um, one would be, and, and I guess it's the, it's the yin and the yang, is, is, is staying with a company for too long where you know, the execution has been sort of you know, slowly getting worse and worse. Uh, we... We we can also sort of fall in love with with names as portfolio managers, and so not only where you might see 
you know, maybe fundamentals beginning to go sideways, but also, um, you know, and I'm a proponent of, of staying with your winners. I think that there's a lot to that, but, but you have to be disciplined. You know, there's, there's a point where, um, like I mentioned earlier with our valuation process, when a company gets to the, the top end of its typical historical range uh, on relative to the market, um, we, we know that it's, it's, it's not likely to be sustainable for long, long periods of time, you know, unless something has, has changed so dramatically within the company that now they're trading in a whole new value, you know, valuation range. Right. So here again, I'd say, you know, mistakes that I've made is, is, you know, you love a stock so much and, and, you know, you think, oh, well, it's trading at 50% of the market. And, I mean, 1.5 X the market or something like that. And, and it's beyond its typical historical range. And I can begin to justify that. But the reality is it does come back to earth at a, at a certain time. So um, it's, it sounds like that we're, we're sort of, um, you know, forgotten about our process and let, let a stock drift too high and not begin to reduce it uh, when, when we should. Um, and then I'd say uh, uh, it, that, that is always can be a problem. You, you know, here, here again, stick to your process and only on companies with, with strong balance sheets. Uh, we've also been enamored with companies that that have made acquisitions and juiced the balance sheet. Um, I, mean, I mean, General Electric would, would be one of those way back when uh, you're using a lot of leverage to, to grow and, and to grow their, their their bank and their financing. And of course, that, that all completely unraveled. So um, it, that can be a killer. So uh, I'd say also, if I've made mistakes sometimes in the past, it's, you know, sticking with a company where the balance sheet was getting blown out and, and uh, uh, too much believing in management's ability to, to, to deal with that. So... I love that. So what's the best piece of advice you'd like to give with the, to the audience or give your 30 year old self? Um, you know, uh, uh, we sort of began our conversation talking about dividends and, and I, I'd go right back to that, that, you know, uh, I wish that uh, maybe I'd invested more in companies that were good, consistent growers o- over time in, 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 in dividends and, and that would it speaks to a lot of what the business they're in. I mean, you could go back to a McDonald's, you know, and say, uh, or even a Starbucks, and say, you know, um, well, it's a pretty basic business. They just they make hamburgers, they make or they make coffee, and yeah, right. you know, good consistent growth and and uh, driving dividends um, throughout all all those times, um, and and just hold on, you know, they're they're just great companies and, and stick with those. Um, but um, I, I would say, you know, to bring it to today. You know, we're in a very interesting time, right? You know, we had inflation news this morning that was better than expected. Um, I, I think that you know what we're looking at today is an environment where we're probably going to have slow growth for who knows? It could be a number of years. And so, I'd say today, and my advice would be would be to stick to the companies that have good durable earnings that that are consistent growers, strong balance sheets um, that have the ability to grow in periods where where I mean, it's not, it's just not going to be like it was, you know, like, yeah. uh, you know, before the pandemic and during the, and after the pandemic, where we had this enormous amount of stimulus, we really don't have the capacity to do that again. You know, we're, we're in this massive tightening phase as, as we should be to sort of correct from what happened. But I, I think today um, y- y- you shouldn't expect that that stimulus is going to happen again. You know, it, it's going to be sort of normal, you know, and, and, and companies are going to be expected to grow um, without all that help and, and uh, all, with all that stimulus. So, yes, yeah, so I'd be focusing on these you know, good, strong, consistent growers, durable, durable earnings, uh, you know, business models that you can really believe in. And uh, I think that's going to work uh, going forward. And I can tell you right now, I look at our, my portfolio and a lot of these names are pretty cheap, you know, yeah. really good upside. So I I'd feel pretty good about that. I love it. So you mentioned valuation a few times, just in closing. How do you determine, and you have target prices too, for companies overvalued, undervalued, or uh, fairly valued? Yeah, like I said, you know, we so we go back to, I'm sorry, um, uh, we, we go back to in the process and, you know, each company, like say, you know, I, I happen to follow energy and I know in energy, you know, the, the EVD beta is, is a big factor and actually price to book is a big long-term, you know, determinant of value for, for these large oil companies. And um, so we, each sector has to have its own, you know, special, you know, valuation model that, that's always worked throughout time for them. In most, okay. most sectors it's, it's PE, but 
you know, let's say they cover it for REITs, it might be FFO, you know, funds from operations and th things like that. So we go back to that and, you know, we, we will we'll look again at, at where they stand within history, where they stand versus their per peers and where they are versus the market overall. And as I said, like, you know, as these companies begin to work their way up to, you know, higher valuations, you know, versus uh, history and, and versus peers, you know, that's that's when we're going to begin to, um, you know, to, to trim. And, you know, we talk a lot about our, 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 we have low turnover in our mind, you know, it's, you know, buy a stock, sell a stock. Um, that's only about, that's like, it's always about less than 20%. But but underneath that, there's a lot of trims and ads that, that are going on where we're taking advantage of these valuation ranges that, uh, that, that we adhere to. Beautiful. Well, Chris, thank you so much for coming on the show today. This has been fantastic. What's the best way for people to get in touch with you? Uh, well, you know, uh, if you go to logancapital.com, um, all our contact data is there and, and we have a great sales team. So yes, I mean, if, uh, if you're a financial advisor and you're looking for a, a good separate account in dividend growth world, uh, we're, we're not a bad, bad place to start. Beautiful. Well, Chris, thank you so much. I hope we'll speak to you again soon. Thanks, Adam.